I ended up telling my story of how I got to be here a lot, and it comes into various messages because there's new people here, and I want them to hear it, but no offense, I've been through some difficult things, and uh, like with a lot of us, part of getting forward with forgiveness is not talking about the same things over and over and over. So uh, tonight, I think you'll recognize we're going to take a little break from our uh, series. Pops, good to see you again. We've missed you. Glad that you're here. And... Uh, and uh, Daniel, thanks for bringing him. Tonight, we're going to take a little break from our series on overcoming rejection and betrayal. And I'm going to do a teaching. Uh, the second half of it, Chuck is going to reteach sometime in the next week or two. But everyone coming into our homes from now on, all the men coming in will have to watch this video. Okay, so it starts off with a lot of our kind of biblical principles. And then it goes into some very, very practical things that we're uh, going to discuss with our house managers and um, so uh, if you're ready to jump in say jump, jump and welcome to all those people who are joining us uh, by video um, people always stop me and ask me what are you doing and how did you get there well um, I was um, born into a family that believed in Christ very much I was born in 1960 someone say well that's old man that is old that is old and um, I was born in 1960, and uh, I was attending a Baptist church with my family. And on a Sunday night in the winter of 1967, I was still six. I hadn't had my birthday yet. The pastor preached a gospel message, and it was the first time I ever remember being under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've never been in a space where... You're just kind of going along and it's just da, 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 and all of a sudden your heart just gets gripped and, and it's like someone's taking hold of you. That was what was happening to me. But it won't surprise you to know that I was kind of a crazy little guy. And so I said, I, they had an invitation to come forward if you wanted to receive Christ, but I was too nervous. We were sitting up in the balcony and I was too nervous to walk down there. But I, as they sang the closing song, I felt like I was missing out on something and I felt like I was losing and not winning, like I should have been giving in, but instead I was still fighting and I didn't even know why. But I know we were walking out um, of the service and uh, I said to my dad as we were going down the stairs, me and my brothers and my parents, I said, Dad, I want to go down front. And he turns to me and he says, no, we're going home. He says, we're going to, I know we want to get home and watch the hockey game. But, but he thought I meant I wanted to go run around with my friends like I normally would. I didn't say, Dad, I want to go down and receive Christ. I just said, Dad, I want to go down front. And he said, no, we're going home. So when my little uh, last display of depravity, um, I wish it was the last. But um, I went home. We used to have to dress up for church. And I can remember being at home in my bedroom, kind of mad that, you know, my parents don't even want me to give my heart to Christ. So I took off my suit and I balled it up. I was supposed to always hang it up. And I balled it up and threw it on a, in a pile in the bottom of the closet in a fit of anger and then stomped out to the kitchen where my mom and dad were drying some dishes. And I said, I want to know why you don't want me to know Christ. Well, boy, I'll tell you what, the look on their face when they turned around, <laughs> I'll never forget it. It said to me, nothing could be further from the truth. They were just horrified that I would even say that. And of course, the little misunderstanding was sorted out immediately and I uh, went with my mother into I remember her bedroom and I remember this because I've always uh, almost always had one of these because my mom led me to Christ from a red Bible and I can still see her hands uh, turning the pages as she opened it and just telling me the story of Christ who died for our sins and rose from the dead and really all of it, honestly, pretty awesome. And uh, that was when I gave my life to Christ. Uh, but like a lot of children who profess faith in Christ, they um, get away from that. Uh, the old hymn writer uh, wrote, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And uh, I was one of those kids that was wandering away. By the time I got to high school, I was smoking pot every day and failing out of my courses and messing up my life pretty foolishly without my parents knowing anything. I really love my mom and dad, but I was a lot further away than they realized. And then it all kind of came uh, crashing down on me. And I recommitted my life uh, to Christ as probably around 17 years of age. And uh, through a long series of events, the Lord really through a youth pastor's influence on my life, the Lord called me to um, uh, preach 
and uh, I was started to preach in student ministry groups when I was just a teenager, and I saw God really use that. So I said, well, I'll go to Bible college for one year only. And then I wanted, of course, to go into business or something, and the Lord didn't allow that. And I just, he just kept that grip on me. And um, Kathy and I moved, got married, and moved to a, uh, work at a church in Windsor, Ontario. Have you ever been to Windsor, Ontario? You'll never hear someone brag about that. <laughs> that's not on anyone's list of great places I've been, but that's where we ended up. And eventually from there, we moved down here to get a master's degree. And um, we ended up staying in this area, starting a church, working at a church, then starting a church. And we spent most of our life here. I always um, would say to people, because I was a big uh, fan of certain sports teams, I would say one team for life, one wife for life, one church for life. And we plan to stay at the church that we planted uh, for our whole life. But um, uh, God had other plans. Uh, it seems crazy now. I, I honestly don't know if I even believe in it anymore. But we started a church with 18 people. And over a period of 30 years, it grew up to be one of the 10 largest churches in North America with 500 employees and a $50 million budget and a million square feet of space. And um, everyone was uh, apparently really blessed by it, but I was uh, doing worse and worse. We have some pictures of those things that we pulled out. So these were our seven campuses that we had around Chicago land, about 13,000 people a week coming. That's one of our Easter services. And we had two of those at the end the last Easter I preached, we had um, um, about four, between four and 500 people give their lives to Christ. That's me there preaching. And um, then uh, we, did, we started doing men's events called Act Like Men. We did that. That's us in Indianapolis with about 14,000 men. And we were doing these conferences around the country and seeing God really. That's me on one of the messages. Um, and then we had, this is our radio audience. You can see we're pretty much everywhere in America on radio. And then we went on television. Um, that was us on television around the world. And um, to say that it was a lot, is there anything else? Um, is that it? Yep. And then we planted churches, of course, all over the world. But to say that it was um, difficult would be to be putting it mildly. And I would say sometime around uh, 2012, but then increasingly 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, it was uh, grinding me down uh, mentally and emotionally to where in the fall of 2017, I went away to a uh, ministry recovery center uh, for a month, just trying to get a grip. Now, if, if you've never kind of lost your ability to... Um, do what you do, then you don't even know what I'm talking about. But if you've ever been just like, there's no gas in the tank, I just can't do this. I would go to meetings. For three years, I went to meetings and I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. One of the main three people, it's a real praise to the Lord, one of the main three people that I met with that led with me in the ministry was in this room about a month ago. And he sat and asked my forgiveness. He said, I knew you needed to quit. And I was afraid to try to do it without you. And uh, so as I was kind of deteriorating and struggling, and uh, has anybody here ever had the experience of regressing in some of the commitments you've made? And I had been very open. I wrote a book in 2000 called Lord Change Me. And if I reference some books here, all of our books are available and for free to anyone who's here. My first book was called, uh, ultimately called Lord Change Me. And in it, I talked about my a struggle with outbursts of frustration and anger when I was under pressure and how the Lord was changing that in me. And I heard that from people all the time. Boy, I just heard it more and more and more. And the Lord was growing me. And I was an example of what it means to have your life changed by Christ. And but by the time I got to about 2017, I started saying to the leaders, I'm, I'm going backwards. And I'm kind of losing my ability to be able to do this. Well, I really wish that I had have left when I did, but instead... What happened was, um, just to say it in the simplest way, a group of people behind our backs pulled together a bunch of accusations. Some of them, I think, had truth in them for sure, but a lot of them were false, And uh, but they never brought them to me. But they used them to get us fired uh, in 
our absence. We were out of town. I left town going to do some ministry somewhere, and we never were ever allowed back in the building. Never were ever. To this day, they've never really met with us or talked to us. What they did do was issue 11 public, because there was a big outcry from the congregation. They issued 11 public statements against me in 2019 and uh, filled, with, filled with false, false, false statements. They took that radio and television ministry I showed you there, shut it all down, canceled all the monthly donors, took all the money that was in the bank, contrary to the contracts that we had, and um, they did a lot more than that that I don't want to go into, but um, to say that is, was devastating would be to be putting it mildly. It was absolutely crushing. And um, to where it took me a year just to be able to kind of function. And uh, I would just say I was uh, very, very broken. Well, I couldn't hardly talk to people without crying and I couldn't, um, um, it's hard to describe if you haven't spent your whole life building something and to have all your best friends that you ever talked to won't even talk to you anymore and to have so many false things said about you. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because that's why I'm here. I have no interest anymore in numbers of people. I don't even know if I really even believe in mega churches anymore because what people are kind of slow to figure out is, is well, we don't want a celebrity pastor. Well, I almost guarantee you, if God has blessed a man's ministry to the place where people would call him a celebrity, he's the one that wants to be a celebrity least of all. And uh, But this is the way things are in the Western world. And when things get big, people love it and pump it up and want to be part of it until they don't. And then it's always typically the leader that they're, we're known for that here in North America, you know, tearing down our leaders. And um, I think it was just way, way too big. I just don't believe in that anymore at all. I don't believe in multiple campus churches. I don't believe in, um, but I still do believe everything that I preached. And I want to tell you why I love the ministry of Act Like Men. And if while you're listening to this, be mindful of the fact that it's being recorded. And uh, I looked at uh, Tucker when he came in today and he's getting baptized tomorrow. You look like a different person than the day that I met you. The difference on your face and to see the addiction falling away from men and to see love and joy and faith coming into their life. I just don't need more than that. Uh, you guys are my inspiration. You guys are my joy and delight. And I'm so thrilled. And I realize some of you participate at different levels. That's all fine. We want you to kind of be able to choose that. But here they come. Thank you for that opportunity to tell my story. Hopefully I won't have to tell it so much. It's not easy to go through that. You understand some of you that have your own uh, struggles. Why rock bottom? Number one, at Act Like Men, I experience broken men. That's what I want now. I want to be around men who have been broken. I want to be around men who have struggled. Uh, there are men that you can be with who haven't struggled that much, but what I find out more often than not is, is that their struggle is still secret. And so I love men that it, it came out. And if you've been grieving or lamenting the fact that it came out, I want you to begin to consider that maybe that's the best thing that ever happened to you. People are, I don't wish that I was back at the church. I don't like how I got here, but I don't wish I was still there. I'm thrilled with what I get to do and feel like the Lord's been really gracious to me. And I want you to believe that by coming here to rock bottom, I always say when I see a car pull in with a, uh, a person who's going through the you know admittance process I would say welcome to rock bottom and if you don't like what it's called then you're probably not going to do very well here because that's where you're at and admitting where you are is a big part of being somewhere else amen, amen. and so um, I was just going to show you from scripture quickly from Genesis 32 an example of a broken man finally and I'll just read it to you, but um, it's important to me that we anchor our thoughts in the Word of God. I've lived for uh, 63 years. The Word of God's been around for thousands of years. 
in 50 years, anything that I ever said will be gone forever. The Bible says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. And so what I'm doing right here is in the best traditions of biblical faith for thousands of years, I'm anchoring what I'm saying to you in the word of God. Now, first God wanted all the people, Adam and Eve, blow out. Uh, start over Noah, blow out. All right, well, I'll just have a nation then. And he calls Abraham, Abraham's son, Isaac, Isaac's son, Jacob. And now we're there. And Jacob... Uh, was um, a twin. I talked about him a few weeks ago. Uh, Jacob was a deceiver. His name actually means deceiver. Remember, I talked about how he was born about 10 minutes after his brother, and 10 seconds after his brother, and he came out grabbing onto him because he wanted to be first, and then he lied to be first, and then he schemed to be first. And uh, let me just read this passage uh, to you. Uh, Genesis chapter 32 Uh, starting at verse uh, 22. Uh, The same night Jacob arose and took his wives, his two female servants and his 11 children crossed the river. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. So he put his whole family on the other side of the river. And a man, it says, It actually turns out it isn't a man. Then they think it's an angel. Then they realize it's the Lord. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He knew that he was with, you know, a supernatural being. And he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And that's why the nation of Israel is called Israel today. This was the father of the nation of Israel, Jacob. He said, you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and my life has been delivered. Jacob had lied to others, trying to get the birthright uh, and the blessing. Did I tell you, the last time I told you the story about the stew and how the brother was making stew, do you remember all that? Now this time, I'll tell you one more. That's how he tried to get the birthright, but the way that he tried to get the blessing, the two things that a father would give to the firstborn was, his brother... Uh, Esau was a hairy man, but he was old and he didn't see very good. So Jacob got some animal skin and put it on his arm and he went in and he kind of tried to talk like his brother and he he says, Father, bless me. And then the father's like, is that my son Esau? Is that my son Esau? And he says, yes, it is, it, it is your son. And so the father prayed this huge blessing over him, believing there was the firstborn. I may have given away the birthright to your younger brother, but he, you're going to get the blessing. And the father poured out his heart. And only later did Esau come home. And uh, let me tell you, there was a major meltdown when he found out that he had deceived the father into doing that too. And Jacob got a lot of things in his life through deceiving. He lied to others. He lied to himself. Jacob knew that to know God's favor, he had to be an authentic person. And uh, so here in the passage, he wrestles with God. And God is trying to bring him to a place of humility, but gently. Uh, By the way, if you're ever in a wrestling contest with God, um, hold up chances that you would win. Okay, talk about pinned, pinned. Everyone in the universe all at once. He spoke a word and the earth melted. God was being patient with Jacob. He was trying to get his attention, trying to, like he does with us, and he's pushing over here, and he's pushing over here, and he's striving and wrestling and trying to get our attention, like he's doing with all of us right now. What is in your life right now that everyone who loves you would agree that's going in the wrong direction? So Jacob had these things and he was wrestling. And so finally God 
just because he was so, the, Jacob was strong and he was persistent. God said, all right. And it says he touched his hip, just touched it. And it went out of joint and had a permanent injury for the rest of his life. That's the Lord. He just touched it and boom. So for the rest of his life, he walked like this and he had a limp. How many people have heard the phrase, he walks with a limp? That comes from this passage. That's what it's talking about. And that's what I think about when I think about the men at rock bottom. They walk with a limp. And I love it because I walk with a limp. And every person who's here walks with a limp. And God has allowed things to happen in your life. And God has allowed pains that are never going to go away entirely to happen in your life. Why? So that when you feel yourself just struggling to get along, just struggling to get forward, you'll be reminding yourself every time you feel that limp, every time you feel that ache in the morning, you'll be reminding yourself, I've wrestled with God. God caused me a little bit of pain to get my attention. And so we pray that this property is a place, these houses are places where men can be wrestling with God and coming to some good conclusions about the rest of their life. So to do that, we need, and are trying to provide these three things, we need, uh, number one, we need confession. Get this and never let it go. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. I don't need to dance for anybody. I don't need to perform for anybody. I am who I am, and I want to be better. I want to be more. I want to go faster. But at the end of the day, I am who I am, and I'm not perfect. And to carry that around with confession is a part of brokenness. And then the second thing is a community. I need others. Most of the mistakes that I've made in life, I made by getting alone. I was alone. If you were to write down on a piece of paper, do it. Write down 10 things you wish you could take back. You'll find that most of those decisions, you made them by yourself. You made the loan. And so we're offering to men here community. And we're trying to draw near to you in a relationship. And if it ever feels like you're getting a little crowded, well, we're trying. Well, you might offend someone. Well, we don't want to offend anyone, but we're going to try. We're trying to get closer to, personally for me, Eddie's a little challenging. Uh, but um, he's awesome, isn't he? So um, community, that's what we're offering here. We're challenging about confession. We're offering community and Christ. And um, the thing with Christ is, is every man has to resign as chairman of the board of his own life. You're not the chairman of the board of your life. If you think you are, there's going to be more crashing ahead. I'm not the chairman of the board of my life. I don't get to call the shots. If I'm calling the shots, I'm probably calling some shots that are going to be bringing some regrets down the road. It's so, so important to be at that place where you understand that. You say, well, am I the chairman? These little questions will help you. You know you're the chairman of the board of your life if. Uh, number one, if you make a lot of quick decisions. I made a difficult decision this week, and I've been wrestling with it for a year and especially wrestling with it very strongly for several weeks. If you make a lot of quick decisions, you're gonna make more bad decisions. You know you're the chairman of the board of your life if you react aggressively when you're pressed. If someone starts to press you, if someone starts to get in your space, if someone starts to say to you, not that, and you fly off the handle, Anybody see the movie Tommy Boy? It's like the best movie, right? And, and uh, Tommy uh, Boy and David Spade, they're driving along in the Mustang, and uh, all of a sudden he outputs a pack of M&Ms, and they hit the dashboard. They go rolling across the dashboard and down the vents. Who's seen that? Do you remember what they say? And he says, oh, you, you don't put them down the vents. You know they're going to melt. And Tommy Boy says, um, Chris Farley, he says, uh, oh, I'm surprised you don't know. They have a thick candy shell. And David Spade says to him, he said, uh, your head has a thick candy shell. And then Tommy Boy comes right back, well, your, your head has a shell on it or something like that because he couldn't think of anything to say. But if when people are giving your input, you're always trying to think of something to say, you're trying to think of something to say, to win, to get back, to go one up. That's not life. That's not confession, community, Christ. No, resign as the chairman of the board of your life. But you haven't, if you make a lot of quick decisions, if you react aggressively when you're pressed, make a note of this. Failure is one thing. Anybody here ever failed? 
Oh my gosh. So many times and so many things. Failure is one thing, but the real destroyer, say it, is? The real destroyer is, say it. And this is what brings men to the very, very bottom. And do you know why we feel shame? We feel shame because someone gave us input and we rejected it and did our own thing. And now here I am out here and everything's just awful because we feel not just the failure, we feel the shame of, I could have did, done better. I, I, I knew what to do. I was offered a chance to do it. People would have helped me do it, but I had to go my own way. Am I right or wrong? Right. This is what ha has to stop. And so resign as chairman of the board of your life and, and become the man when people say this or this or this to you. They're like, well, I don't have a hundred brothers. I don't even know if I really have 10, but I have a few. You're one of them. And either you're going to have to change your mind or I'm going to have to because I'm, I don't want to be apart from you. I don't want to be apart from you. I don't want to lose this, what we have. Here's the uh, last thing I wrote down. You know you're the chairman of the board <clears throat> in your life if I could get some water. No, and someone will bring it to me. It's okay, thanks, Tucker. You know you're the chairman of the board in your life if you find that your circle is getting smaller. I hope your circle's getting bigger. I hope the number of people in your phone that you could call and get a good response I'm so glad to come on up here. Uh, Tucker, he's, he's just a handsome guy. He likes to get on the camera as often as he can. Thank you for bringing me this water. Of uh, congratulations on, what did you, did you say, 60 days? Yeah, four, months. four months, that's just so great. So, um, excuse me. It's, if you find that your circle is getting smaller, people don't like to be around dictators. They don't like it. They like to be around people that it can be like a two-way street and we both listen and we both adjust. You, you'll notice, for example, there's not a lot of people uh, calling their kid um, Adolf these days, right? You can't find that anywhere. Nobody's calling their uh, kid a Benito. There's no Mussolini's in the phone book. Why? Because these names that are infamous for being a dictator and don't care what it costs I will have my way in all things. It's so destructive. So I love act like men because I experience here broken men. And those are some of our characteristics. Here's the last thing under that heading. We do not gossip or break confidence. Do you know the two? So I'm saying I want us to be about this. I'm saying whether you've been here for six months or 18 months, we don't gossip. I don't want to gossip about anyone. I don't want any words to come out of my mouth that are causing you to think less of someone else. Do you understand that? That's just not okay. That's the opposite of love. Now we're going to fail, but we're going to say we're sorry when we fail. And we're going to try not to fail again. We do not gossip. That's speaking things that are half truths about someone else in a disparaging way. And we do not break confidence. The greatest gift you could give to the men here that we minister to and the rest of you who are listening in, the greatest gift you could give to a treasured relationship would be the confidence that what was shared with you would not go anywhere. And I did my doctoral studies on this increasing disclosure between men. And I know that the main thing that men fear is it won't be confidential. And men are desperate to tell their story to someone but they're afraid that it won't be confidential. You'll use that to hurt me. And if you've got a relationship where someone's threatening to use what you told them to hurt you, run as fast as you can. That's just an awful, awful, awful thing to do. Here's the second thing about act like men. At act like men, I experience humble men. At act like men, I experience broken men, broken men. Now, it's one thing to have a limp. Now we know what that is. I got some problems I couldn't solve. I got stuck in some places I couldn't get out of. I had to go live in a house where I could get some help, right? True or false? And, and it's going good. And I, I'm gonna this is gonna be the turnaround for me, but I'm always gonna have a limp now. I'm never gonna not go to sobriety meetings. I'm never gonna be able to have a drink. 
I'm never going to be able to go and hang out some places where other people do. I'm not trying to get that back. It's gone forever. That, come on, guys, someone say amen. amen. That's my limp. That's my limp. Sometimes the guys are going to be like, let's go here. I'm, it's fine. I'll see you all tomorrow. Um, I just know that that's not a place I can go. I know that's not a place I can be. I know that's a thing I can't do. I can't be around those people because I'm weak. That's my limp. But here's the awesome thing. The Apostle Paul had some kind of a physical infirmity that God had allowed. We don't know what it was. I think they left it general so that uh, we could all sort of imagine that it's our thing, right? It could have been a problem with hearing. It could have been a problem with his, a weakness in his voice. It could have been a particular temptation, maybe with lust or uh, maybe with material things. I mean, we just don't know. But here, Paul said three times, 1 Corinthians 12, three times I asked the Lord to take this away from me. And three times he said no. Instead, the Lord said to Paul about his thorn in the flesh, it's called. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what Paul said then? This is pretty awesome. He said, most gladly therefore will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So Paul's like, I got a limp. I got a limp. He's so thankful for the thing that reminds him that it's not about him. He's so thankful for the thing that reminds him that he's vulnerable. He, he's glorying in that weakness. This thing about you that you can't go certain places, you can't do certain things, this limp that's going to be with you forever, whatever all of that is for you, is a really, really awesome thing. And it is the thing that can keep you going in the greatest direction with your life, right? And so to get to the place where you're thankful for it, that's the humility, guys. It takes a lot of humility to just say, that's who I am. That's... My decisions got me here. That's who I am. And I'm going to delight in the fact that that's who I am because I can do a lot more with my life now that I know where I'm weak. I really, really, really like that. Um, at Act Like Men, we seek clients in recovery who want to live authentically. Authentically. And... Uh, that's why we're moving toward our um, Saturday night meeting being uh, mandatory. And we're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction. And uh, the reason for that is, is that, um, you know, you're not children. We're not going to chase the people here. But we do expect our men to be in our church on Saturday nights. You know, by the way, the most common complaint that people have about church, you know what it is? Number one, they ask for money, but we never did. No offerings are ever taken here, ever, nor will there be, okay? Number two reason people don't like church, they make me sing all the time. See, so I already knocked the two big things right off the list for you. And um, we, here's the reason we call it a church. Um, one of the big things, as you know, in AA, which I have a lot of respect for, what step is it came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity? Come on, what's, what step is that? That's two. Do you believe that? Do you believe that a power greater than yourself can restore your brokenness Amen. to sanity, to clear thinking? Interesting. Uh, step number three um, is very much in keeping with that. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. But let me just ask you this, you five times a week meeting guys. How many times at your uh, other meetings... Are you getting instruction about this God that you're coming to know? How often? I'm told the answer is never. You never get specific instruction about who this God is, yet he's very significant. After the first step of my life becoming uncontrollable, the next step is, is that um, I believe a power greater than me. What do you know about that power? Um, I made a decision to turn my lives and my life and my will over to him as I understood him but how much do you understand him doesn't it make sense that he's so significant in those steps that you'd give one meeting a week to 
I've spent my whole life thinking and talking and teaching about God. And I'm not saying I got the market cornered, not at all. But this is your chance. This is your chance to let that flesh out and get more and grow. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And that's what's happening here. And you may find that your faith is growing without you even trying because the Word of God is having an impact in your life. It's such an incredible thing. It really, really is. Question for you. When was the last time God took you to the mat with the full weight of who he is? I mean, took you down hard. That's what's going on here on Saturday nights. Maybe not this week, maybe not last week, but during the weeks and months that you're here, we want you to give God a chance once a week. And we think that makes sense. We think that's respectful of what we're trying to do to influence you. And no one's asking you to pray, and no one's asking you to teach, and no one's asking you to give, and no one's asking you to sing. But we are asking you to think about the Word of God and open your hearts uh, with us. So, here's the third thing. Um, At Act Like Men, I experience broken men, humble men, and authentic men. I, I just... I just don't see, I have a pretty sensitive BS meter is what I would call it. And I just don't see a lot of men here who are like BSing. Now, you know, um, I think some struggle and I understand that, but I just find a lot of authentic uh, people here and I'm finding a lot of joy in it. I love 1 Samuel 16, 7, which says that uh, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And uh, we can pose and posture for one another, but God's looking at our heart. And this is a a once-a-week opportunity for us to kind of probe and have us all thinking about what's really going on in my heart. Because before I'm ever lying to others, I'm always lying to myself, right? And so, um, note this. We want you to feel loved and accepted and supported as you never have in your life before on your road to sobriety. That's what we want. We don't want you to feel threatened. We don't want you to feel that someone is angry with you. We want you to feel loved and supported. And uh, that's what authenticity is all about to me. Authentic means to be your true self and to love others for being their true selves. That's why we're so hard on don't gossip about people, don't judge other people. Don't say hard things to people. If, if Bill's a little frustrating in the kitchen or whatever, he's a quirky dude. There's your chance to learn to love people. And we're going to struggle with that. I understand that. But the people that we're doing community with, wherever you live, around the world, the people that you are doing community with are your opportunities to learn to love the way that God calls us to love. The hardest person at work, the hardest person at your house, The hardest person in your neighborhood. Those are not inconveniences. Those are God appointments to learn to love the way that God wants us to. So, again, we want you to feel loved and accepted and supported as never before on your road to lasting sobriety. Anyone not on that priority here is on their way out. Clear? Clients come first. 1 Corinthians 16 is the act like men verse. It says, watch, stand firm in the faith. These are five imperatives. Watch, pay attention. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. That's where it comes from, right of the scriptures. Be strong. And then let all that you do be done in love. And those are the five things we're working on. We're, gonna, we're giving every man who comes into our house a copy of my Act Like Men book, which has um, those five imperatives, eight devotionals on each of those five imperatives. They're both about, each is about three pages long. It's not a book you read all at once. But I'd like to believe that uh, some of the nightstands in our houses have that book there. And either last thing at night or first thing in the morning, you just get up and read two and a half or three pages. 
and keep going over these things over and over and over. Watch, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Okay, well, this will go a little faster now, but this is um, uh, the second part. And I think I'll put the third part off till next week and have Chappie do it. But I'm going to go through now the Ten Commandments of an Act Like Men house. Ready? This is structure. We've needed some structure so that you guys can know what the priorities are. And um, here's the first thing. You might not love this. Um, The house manager. Let's have our house manager stand. House manager stand. House manager. Maybe someday. Let's have our house manager stand. Okay, there they are. Those four men. All right, thank you, men. Be seated. The house manager is your daddy. Okay? And if he makes you call him that, that's not good. Um, But you listen to me. It can't work any other way. Listen to him. Support him. Cheer for him. If you believe that you're being wronged by the house manager, go to him and talk to him about it. And if you've attempted that quite a few times, um, if you've attempted that, uh, if you've attempted that quite a few times, and it's a big deal, we don't want to do that about who cleaned out the brownie tray, okay? And if you had to clean up the bathroom when somebody else made the mess, you'll be fine. But if you're really being, it sounds like that was hitting a little too close to home. But listen, listen, if it's a big thing, I want you to hear me on this because I don't even want this for myself. No real leader wants to be unaccountable. And so um, if you're being mistreated in some way and you can't resolve it with the house manager, you can go uh, to Chuck and he will, he and I will discuss it. But I don't want to find out in three months or in six months that some person was being poorly treated or being subject, subjected to someone else's anger. And I promise you that our house managers don't want it. And our house managers are empowered if they can't get someone to stop doing something like that, they can come to us because uh, our sober behavior should be the best behavior of our lives. And increasingly so, because as that produces good fruit, we'll have greater joy in it. All right, that's the house manager. Um, chores are mandatory for everyone. Every one of these houses has fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars worth of furnishings and improvements. Um, actually, uh, Dave is the reason. As of Monday morning, Dave's the reason there isn't a washer and dryer at Highland. <laughs> because I gave him approval for that already a day ago. So I'm just having fun with him. But they have waited. To my apologies. My apologies. I don't blame nobody else for that. Only myself. Okay? Clear? But I only really became aware of it now. And I'm teasing Dave, but we're going to get that solved. And um, I want to be, we're going to make some improvements. This guy right here, Peter, his whole business, he runs a big painting company that's very successful. He did all the painting in here. He's always asking me, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? Some week I'm going to introduce to you these people, Ryan and... Uh, Eduardo and there's there, I'm not going to name them all but people that are in this room right now who come here to help us that's why they're here to help us and to be part of what God's doing here and so I'm going to talk to him afterwards and we're going to get those little drywall fixes that are needed and if you see something in your house that's needed there's a channel that's opened now through your house manager to get those things known to us because we have to take care of these houses I don't want somebody who comes here in five years to be like yeah you should have been there five years ago it was way better we have to take care of it okay And uh, so chores are mandatory for everyone. Number three, curfew must be respected. Exceptions require approval in advance. All right, and we're going to use the app, use the app, use the app for your communications. Use the app, and then there's a record of it. Nobody can say you didn't ask if it's right there in the app. So just put everything in the app, and then that's what we'll all live by. Did we ask in advance and so on? But curfew has to be respected. That's for the... You know, if somebody's not respecting that, then that's pretty demotivating to the other people that I live with, you know. Um, Rent needs to be automatic and on time. And we know that some of you, when you come in, you can't pay your rent automatically yet. And so our house managers are going to be helping you get that solved. And we want to be helpful to you in that too. We have a couple of places where we can open bank accounts. 
And um, so that's uh, very, very uh, important to us. Um, it's not finalized yet, but take a deep breath. Part of this you're going to love, part of this you're not going to love. Um, I'm uh, pretty sure that we're going to raise the rates to calm down, Mr. Republican National Convention. We're going to raise the rates um, to $200 a week, but wait. We're only raising what comes to the ministry by $5. And the, the uh, cost of living right now would be more like about 12 or 13 since we started. We're, we're raising it by $5, so the ministry will get $175, and the other $25 is going to go in a bank account for you. We have a, over a six-figure amount of money in the bank right now, so you don't have to be worried about your deposit. But the number of weeks that you are here, times $25 a week, will be in a check or cash put into your hand when you leave. And so I believe this with all of my heart. You will never get ahead financially until you learn to live on less than you make. If you can't set money aside, if you always spend it all, you'll never have the kind of accumulation that is needed to get ahead. And so we're going to do that with everyone. 200 a week, 175 to us, 25 in a bank account for you. And all you have to do is um, depart properly. And it's not a trick. Here it is. Number five, departure is now going to become a process. I'm not going to be hearing any more about Dave left on Thursday. If Dave left on Thursday, he left a lot of money in the bank. We'll immediately withdraw that money and we'll put it into the ice cream cone fund. I don't want it. Okay. I'm just saying we want you to leave. We want you to leave with the, listen, with the support of your house manager and with the support of your sponsor. And when your sponsor and your house manager agree and say, good, it's time to go. Then we're going to have an exit interview where we're going to sit down with you and we're going to ask you to tell us everything that we need to know. What are we getting wrong? What are we getting right? What needs to change? We're going to show respect for you and for what you've learned and you're going to help us be better. So we're going to listen to you. You're going to have an exit interview. Then you're going to watch a video that we're going to prepare. Some of you can help us with this on how to make it on the outside. You're going to watch the video. You're going to do an exit interview and you're going to have the money that you saved passed to you. That's how you leave. But if I come over here anymore on a Thursday, I'm like Bill just walked out. Well, we know where he's going. Nowhere good because he just, you know what I'm saying? You have placed yourself in a community. It took a little bit of work to get you in here. And you can leave whenever your sponsors and so on want you to go. And I'll tell you now, if you're determined to go without their support, I will still get your money to you. I don't want your money. Okay, so if you're determined, we will ultimately give that to you, all right? But we're asking you to go through a process in leaving so that there's just that much better of a chance for you to be successful. Um, for new people coming in, certainly, uh, church attendance is a requirement. Um, so that's where we're headed. If you, obviously you were here before we changed that, but that's what it's going to be. We're going to be here on Saturday nights and that's what we're going to be asking of our people. And we're going to make it as fun as we can and as generous as we can and as helpful as we can. Um, number six, no pornography, no drugs, no alcohol, all medications locked up by the house manager and access through him. Okay. Seven, and I love this, drug tests are random and regular. They're timed on purpose to surprise you. So if you had a drug test on Monday, I hope you have another one Tuesday night. Maybe. We don't, you don't know when it's coming. You just don't know. And the house managers are trying to trick you. Okay? And that's for all of our good. Someone say amen. amen. <laughs> We're going to be starting a midweek AA meeting, a true AA meeting here in this room. And you're encouraged to come, but if that's not the best five meetings a week for you, you can do something different. We're going to be starting an AA meeting here. We're also going to be encouraging some of our guys that are really doing well for a while to start their own AA meeting if you want to. And that's this facility is here for you if you book it. And you were talking about having an AA meeting for younger people. You could, you could do that right here if you wanted to. And people from the outside could come. All right. We're, we're, these facilities belong to the Lord and they are for the purposes that we're talking about right now. Just two more. 
This might be 11. I saw there was two number fives. <laughs> this is pretty straightforward. No food in rooms. No food in rooms. No food in rooms. What? What did he say? No, yeah, no, no, not, yeah, no, right, know that there is no food in rooms. And um, that's real important. Um, lastly, and you guys have been really great in this. Ray, you've been great in this. Service to the overall mission with your skill or trade or time goes a long way in saying thanks and giving back to this special place so that we can continue to develop it and flourish it and help men get free uh, with the Lord's help, okay? Now there's a little bit more that we'll go into our um, orientation that we're gonna record. It's uh, what we believe, but that's more than enough time sitting here. It's a little bit hot. So I'm gonna have a word of prayer with all of you guys. And um, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Lord, we commit this place afresh to you. We thank you that you are God above God on earth, God in our hearts. And we believe that you spoke and the worlds were formed. We believe that you came into this world and lived a sinless life and died a suffering death to pay the penalty for our sins. And we receive the forgiveness that you offer. We need it so badly. And we believe what you say that through faith in Jesus, we are washed and we are clean. And we invite your Holy Spirit afresh to come into our lives this moment and fill us and uh, control us so that the words of our mouth uh, would be uh, pleasing in your sight. And we pray that you would cause us to have grace for one another. And uh, we pray that you would cause us to flourish in the freedom that Christ rose from the dead to provide. And we pray that you would make this place, our facilities, a place of great victory and uh, that this community could continue to flourish and that even as there are some here tonight who have graduated in that sense, thank you that they feel like they're coming back to family and may that always be the case for everyone with a willing heart. Uh, these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.